You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome or welcome back to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, with me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Well, it has been a week, as per usual. Uh, it just seems to continuously be a week. Uh, so I have I have some news and stuff I want to talk about. But first, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who has been rating and reviewing. Um, not only uh, because you're awesome, because you're really fucking sweet. And if you're not sweet, you're funny. Sometimes you're both, which I love. You folks have all been just so fucking lovely. So basically, in order to move up the charts and stay in the charts, like downloads is part of it, but also is rating and reviewing. So if you rate and review five stars, it just boosts you up the crazy Apple Podcasts algorithm. And when you like write a review, no matter what you say, it doesn't matter what you say, you could literally say anything. But the fact that you've said something boosts that. So you could just be like, I enjoy banana bread, it would just still boost it. And as such... Quite a lot of um, podcast hosts, you know, they'll say, you know, it isn't for our egos, you know. I'm going to be honest, it is absolutely also for my ego because you say so many amazing, lovely things that it just fills me with joy, especially especially when the days are that little bit tougher or, or, you know, like if I'm in a bit more pain and stuff like that, you know, it's just, they just brighten up my day and I am, and I'm not going to deny that, like you'll make me so happy. Not that I wouldn't be happy if you weren't, you know, saying nice things about me, but it just helps, you know, it just really makes me feel good. And the fact that you appreciate what I'm doing and that you really enjoy what I'm doing, it makes it, it makes it really, really worth it because I can, I can hear you. I can see you. Um, People also DM me on Instagram and I haven't responded to anybody in a wee while just because I've been so busy and I I don't want to give somebody a half-arsed response because I don't do anything by halves. And um, speaking of that, apparently uh, I'm not happy unless I am far too busy because I just I just cannot give myself a break. So on top of redecorating a house, ju- literally just to make it livable, um, not for any sort of, I mean, a wee bit of aesthetic, obviously. If I'm going to live somewhere, I want to enjoy it. But so not only is that part of the process, I'm doing a few events. There's a few things in the works that's coming up. I'm also um, curating social media for um, an international arts festival. And and I decided on top of all of this, along with my job, my, my employment, and, you know, actually seeing my children and also managing to see my boyfriend, which is, there's just a lot going on. I decided to add on top of that, I'm going to write a fucking book. Not not a book about fucking. I mean, maybe a wee bit about fucking, but not completely about fucking. So, <laughs> see, what happened was, if you follow me on TikTok, you've probably seen me rant in the garden in my pyjamas about a bunch of things. So I was doing some research for something that I was going to talk about on the podcast, but now I'm going to put in the book instead. Uh, <laughs> This is what sparked it all off because I, I had a few ideas because um, a friend of mine, Mark, from the Bearded Badger Storytelling, the podcast, he had always said to me, you know, have have a couple of books in the back of your head, you know. And I did. I had some plans and I had, you know, whispers and ideas and I had a few things planned out. And then I was doing research and I'm reading this book about basically wartime. It's a wartime book by a historian. And I was reading this. The way I see it is if you're going to write a book, the whole purpose of writing the book is to tell a narrative story. If you're writing a non-fiction book, you, you need a narrative story. Like you'll see that some of them, what they'll do is they'll have like a section in the middle for photos or documents, things like that. Fine. Even even fiction books do that sometimes. I'm fairly certain when I was younger, I had a hardback copy of Black Beauty and there was just like two sections, which was just artwork regarding that people had made about the book Black Beauty. Like, and it was just, or maybe just like random 
paintings of horses. I'm not entirely sure now. But anyway, my point. So I'm reading this book. So basically I'm reading this book about espionage in World War II in Britain. And page after page, it was a copy and paste, effectively, of reports. And they were like separated with, you know, a sentence or two. And it's like, if I wanted to read the reports, I would just go read the reports. Like, I can get them through the Freedom of Information Act. It's not difficult. You know, I mean, if you really wanted them there, put them in the back of the book, you know, something like that. But it really took me out for context. Like, I am someone who quite happily, you know, scours through, like, shipping manifests. Like, I was doing this for my uncle a few weeks ago. I was literally looking through a shipping manifest from 1912, May 1912. You know, I I go through reports and documents and really dry materials all the time, which is usually how I then explain things to people on, like, this or TikTok. You know, I, I, I read the shit, you know. But, like, that being in a book was just so weird to me because when you're just shoving in documents over and over again and and with a couple of sentences and then this happened you know and then this happened and this report was received on such and such a few days later this report came through you know like all it does is show me that you do not know how to convey this information in a narrative format like and if you cannot tell me the story don't fucking write a book just don't do it and it's yet another pale and stale male historian who instead of, you know, just telling the contents of it, felt the need to just paste it. I don't... I know it's silly to get, like, irate about it, but it really, really bothered me. Because for me, reading, I like to be immersed in it. Like, there are ways to share this information. You, you can index it, you shove it in the appendices, you can, again, put those sort of pictures, do- copies of the documents in the, you know, the centre of the book thing that people do. There's probably a proper term for it, but I don't know what it is. (laughs) Just do the thing! And this book just put me on a warpath. Like, to the point that I just straight up decided, you know, no more waiting around, no more Dawson. Nah, I'm just gonna fucking do it and I'm gonna write a book. So that was bad enough, right? That was bad enough. But the icing on top of the cake for me, you see, was... The manner in which the woman in this story was being portrayed was kind of sexist. I say kind of sexist. It was very much sexist. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking quite your jibber jabber. In fact, me. In fact, you I will. But first, we're going to get our source on. We have Typhoid Mary, an urban historical by Anthony Bourdain. Typhoid Mary, captive to the public's health by Judith Walzer Levitt. The Curious Career of Typhoid Mary by George A. Soper. And Typhoid Fever, a history by Elise Mara and Richard Adler. And of course, we have our favourites, history.com, biography.com and the smithsonian.com. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then we'll begin. Typhoid Mary. Not her given name, obviously. That would be a bit weird. Oh, what have you chosen to name your child? Oh, you know, Chicken Pox Tony, Salmonella Ruth. No. No. Typhoid Mary was born Mary Mallon on the 23rd of September 1869 in Cookstown, County Tyrone in Northern Ireland. Although then it would have just been Ireland. Um, there wasn't a partition at the time, so Ireland. So during the 1800s, there was like mass immigration from Ireland to America. So there was a couple of reasons. There was one big one, but there's a couple of them that all sort of play together. There's no home rule. So Ireland at the time was ruled by Britain and so they have no rights to govern themselves. Everything is by the crown. Everything comes to the ruling class of of Britain. Even the landlords in Ireland were generally of British descent and they would have more rights than, you know, Irish people. So this was like a big issue. With that as well comes this religious conflict. So you've got, you know, Catholics versus Protestants. You'll notice that quite a large number of the people who were immigrating, they were Irish Catholics. Which leads me to the next point, which is people were fucking poor, especially Catholics. You'd see more money would be in the, the, the Protestant areas. Um, I think they even touch on that in the TV show with Dairy Girls. They're like, Protestants have more money. Yeah, <laughs> they did. So, so like that was, that's just how things were. And then the biggest motherfucking factor for people immigrating in the 1800s 
was the famine. So Ireland actually had two famines. Um, there's Angorta Moor, which is the large hunger, the big hunger, and Angorta Bug, which is the little hunger. So the Great Famine was between 1845 and 1852. It was horrifically devastating. Like there was mass, mass immigration during that. And it, it was huge. And the population of Ireland still hasn't recovered from that. Like it just hasn't. So in 1879, there was like a wee famine and got a bug, right? Um, it wasn't as bad, obviously, as, you know, the Great Famine. There's a reason one's, you know, big and one's small. Also, I'm just going to throw this in here because I can, because it's my podcast and I can say what I fucking want. We always talk about potatoes. Like, we always talk about the blight, the potato blight. And we rarely discuss the fact that Britain was taking food, grain, all that kind of stuff from from Ireland and using it to feed Britain. And we never fucking talk about the chickens. So there was cholera in chickens. And this was a massive fucking issue. But we never bring up the chickens. It's always like, la 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 all the Irish and their potatoes. It's like, what, you, what about the chickens? You never mention the fucking chickens. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm ranting. But anyway, so 1879, there's like a smaller famine. So during Mary's lifetime, there is a second famine. Mary is from Tyrone. And Tyrone, surprisingly enough, isn't exactly the richest of places. So let's get back to Mary. So it's 1883 and Mary is 14 years old. I've had places state that she was 15, but if she travelled in 1883 and she was born in 1869, she was 14, motherfuckers. 13 maybe, 14. But she definitely wasn't 15 because that's just math, okay? It's just sums. Anyway, so Mary sets sail. She leaves Ulster and heads for a new life in the Americas. Uh, she probably sailed from Derry because I was looking at a map, right? I was looking at a map. Derry is much closer to Tyrone than Belfast is. The boat ride to Ellis Island probably would have taken like up to up to 12 weeks. So after a three month jaunt, which let's face it, um, probably not the most comfortable of sailings. Um, if you ever get a chance to go inside a famine, replica famine ship. Uh, which I would not suggest you do if you're claustrophobic because it's very it's very dark and it's very cramped and it just kind of gives you an idea of what of what the sailing would be like it's it's very close quarters it's not it's not pleasant by any means but you know these are people who used to live on dirt floors in winter so I mean you know made of hardier stuff than the most of us probably yeah after three months at sea she makes it to Ellis Island, gets the processing, and then goes to New York, uh, New York City, and stays with her aunt and uncle for a time. And for a wee while, she gets work as a domestic, which is, you know, very typical of uh, girls and women of her age in that era. So she got a job as a, as a domestic, as a maid. And then, as it turns out, she's actually, she's actually a dab hand in the kitchen. She's a pretty good cook. She has skill and flair and... So she's like, this is it. This is the job. I'm going to do this. Also, in addition, furthermore, working in the kitchen and being a cook earned her much more money than if she was just a maid. If you're good at something and it pays you more, of course you're going to do it. So as far as we can tell, Mary was working as a cook for all of these like affluent, these rich New York families between 1900 and 1907. What exactly she was doing between, you know, landing in New York City and in the 1900s, that seven year stretch, we know she was a domestic servant, but whether or not she was cooking at all through that process, we just don't have all the information. It just isn't there. Now, before I go any further, I should probably explain what typhoid fever is. So it's this bacterial infection that can spread throughout the body because it affects a bunch of organs. It's caused by this bacterium called Salmonella typhi, which is related to the Salmonella that causes food poisoning. So typhoid fever itself, it's really fucking contagious and the bacteria is passed out of their body generally through their excrement. That's right, your poo. You can also, less common, but it can also come out through your pee too. So it can come out through urine 
or fecal matter. So if someone consumes something, whether they're eating food or drinking water, that has been contaminated by like a teeny weeny amount of fecal matter or urine, they can become infected with the bacteria and as a result get typhoid fever. So kids are more likely to actually contract um, typhoid fever because their immune systems are still developing, but children actually have milder symptoms than adults if they get it. Speaking of symptoms, the main symptoms are fever, headache, sort of, you know, aches and pains and stuff, fatigue, cough and constipation. Now, there are also like other bits to it, like, you know, you you can get a rash, you can feel sick, you can have nausea, stomach pains and everyone's favourite symptom of any disease, diarrhoea. And if typhoid fever isn't treated, you know, pretty sharpish, the symptoms can get worse to the point where it can actually kill you. So at the turn of the century in New York City, typhoid fever was sort of an epidemic. There were multiple, multiple outbreaks in New York alone. And it was seen as like a poor people disease because it was in areas where, you know, there was poverty or lower income, more crowded, less, you know, sanitation regulation. And because you know, antibiotics weren't developed to treat it, one in 10 cases of typhoid fever would be fatal. People would get to the point where they're just delirious and then they would die. In New York in, what, 1906, there were 639 reported deaths of typhoid. That's what was reported, you know, given, you know, the area and reporting methods of the time. Chances are, there, there's a higher number than that, but that's what we have. Even though there were outbreaks at the time, none had ever been traced back to like one single person. It was never this one person caused this outbreak. It was always like a number of factors and reasons came into it. So like one person was never to blame, was never the root cause, especially someone who had zero symptoms themselves. And that brings us back to Mary Mallon. So in 1900, she gets a job in Mamarunek, New York. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I practiced. Like within two weeks of her being there, the residents develop typhoid fever. In 1901, she gets a job in Manhattan. And when she's employed there, some members of the family, they have fevers and diarrhea. And the laundress, she dies. So after this... Mary, she goes and she gets employed by this lawyer and his family. And seven out of the eight people in this household fall grievously ill. After that, she lands another cook job with a very rich lawyer, a Mr. Henry Gilsey. And within one fucking week, one week, the laundress, I don't know, what is it with her and laundresses? The laundress gets infected with typhoid. And out of the seven servants, four of them become ill. But no members of Gilsey's family were actually sick um, because the family lived in one residence and the staff all had their own their own wee house. Gilsey hires an investigator, um, a Dr. Wilson, who does this wee well, investigation and he comes to the conclusion that it was the laundress that was making everybody sick, that she was the root, she was the starting point that made everybody ill. Um, But he obviously, he cannot prove it. It's just because she was the first one to exhibit symptoms. So obviously he's like, yeah, it was her. She was the starting point. But as soon as this little sort of... But basically, once the other servants start getting sick, Mary fucks off. She heads to Tuxedo Park, where she works for George Kessler. And within a fortnight, Within two weeks, the laundress, again, again with the laundress, the laundress gets infected and she ends up being taken to St. Joseph's Regional Medical Centre. They're really fucking surprised because this is the first time in so fucking long that they've had a case of typhoid. Again, because it's more affluent, you know, this is an area in Orange County, New York, not to be confused with Orange County in California. But seriously, what is it with her and the laundress? 
What is she doing with the laundry maid? Why is she in such close physical contact? Is she hand feeding her? Is she like getting her to drink water from her hands? Is she getting her to suck food off of her fingers? Why? Oh, no, no, that wouldn't make sense. Like, what? No, it would be weird. Statistically, it wouldn't make sense for all of the laundresses to be lesbians. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. Like, I was just trying to think of, like, why there'd be such close physical contact. Like, why would the laundress specifically be the first person to get sick? Why are they consuming, you know, the bacteria more than anybody else? But moving on, in 1906, in August, Mary gets employed by Charles Henry Warren, a wealthy New York banker who had decided to rent a house in Oyster Bay on Long Island for the summer, as is their way, because rich people like to get out of the city and enjoy themselves. Ha ha ha! So Mary comes along, and from August 27th to September 3rd, six of the 11 people in the family contract typhoid fever. And this was kind of a big deal. Like, there were three doctors in the area at the time, and they were like, this is really fucking weird. I mean, the direct quote is that they said it was unusual. I'm paraphrasing. That's not the point. It was very strange for typhoid to be in Oyster Bay because it was very much, it was the poor people's disease. It happened in the slums of New York. It didn't happen in the affluent Oyster Bay area. No. So the landlord at this point, he's shitting a fucking brick because he knows damn fine well that he's not going to be able to rent out his house if it's got a reputation for having typhoid. So he hires like all these experts, you know, independent of each other, just to make sure he's not getting fucked over. And they test everything. So they are checking water from um, pipes, taps, faucets, the toilets, and quote unquote, the cesspool. And every single one of these sources, these water sources, they test negative for typhoid. In late 1906, Mary gets employed by Walter Bowen in Park Avenue. By early 1907, their maid gets sick, followed by two servants who have to then get hospitalised. And then the daughter of the household, she contracts typhoid fever and she dies. And it was here in the kitchen of this Park Avenue penthouse that Mary Mallon was confronted by one George Soper, an investigator who'd been hired by the Long Island landlord. So George... (laughs) <laughs> was actually a civil engineer by trade. But like over time, he ended up becoming this like sanitation expert. And he was brought in by the New York state itself to investigate disease outbreaks. Like this was very much his jam and his butter. Now, starting in the Oyster Bay property and working backwards, George had been looking into these typhoid outbreaks and these prominent prosperous families Because they were really weird. Because normally these sort of outbreaks would happen in crowded, unsanitary places. And the homes of the wealthy rarely are those, you know? And so while he's looking into these cases, he discovers a common denominator. An Irish cook with blonde hair, blue eyes and a determined jaw was at each one of the outbreaks when they occurred. Unfortunately... 
getting a hold of her was pretty difficult because she always buggered off, you know, after the outbreak. And she never left a forwarding address. Luckily for George, though, Mary was still working for the Bowens while he was investigating. So he walks into that Park Avenue apartment and he confronts her. He, he says that he was, and I quote, as diplomatic as possible. But he did just walk into a woman's work and accused her of spreading a deadly disease. And then asked her for samples of urine and faecal matter. At which point she gets really fucking mad and threatens him with a carving fork. Now, in some places I've seen this reported as like a knife, but it was a fork. His own report says fork. She tried to fork him. Now... If some strange man that I didn't know sauntered into my place of employment, accused me of making a fuck ton of people ill, and then wanted toilet samples from me, especially in the early 1900s, I too would be, get the fuck away from me, you creepy wee bastard. No. I'd poke him with a fork. So Georgie boy here, he's like, okay, this is obviously the wrong approach. And he then goes and compiles this just fucking list of everywhere she worked, who got sick, so on and so forth. He then finds her boyfriend and goes over to his place with a doctor to try and convince Mary to, you know, give them, like, stolen urine samples. And Mary, again, is like, no! At which point George is like, fine, okay, this isn't getting me anywhere. And he contacts the New York City Health Department and he shows the investigators, you know, all of his info and they're like, okay, you definitely have a case here. So they get her arrested as a public health threat. So she gets forced into an ambulance by a doctor and five policemen. And in order to restrain Mary, Dr. Josephine Baker had to physically sit on her. Mary ends up getting taken to the Willard Parker Hospital where she was restrained through, you know, appropriate methods and not having a doctor sit on her and she is forced to, you know, give the urine and still samples. And over the course of four days, you know, if she wanted to go to the toilet, she could not go unaccompanied. There had to be someone with her. And so they, you know, they study the samples and they discover that she was excreting massive, massive amounts of typhoid bacteria, which then brought them to the conclusion that the main source of infection in her body was her gallbladder. And by questioning Mary, they discover a couple of things. That she doesn't really wash her hands, she rarely washed her hands, but at the time, this wasn't really unusual because lots of people hadn't quite grasped the concept of germ theory, which we know now is very much wash your hands, wipe front to back, etc, etc. And on top of this, they believe that her main way of spreading, you know, typhoid was through peach ice cream. Because she would make ice cream and chop um, peaches into it and freeze it, that was like her thing. It was her signature dish, some might say. And while other foods that were prepared were cooked thoroughly um, and would sort of get rid of the salmonella typhi bacteria... Ice cream, obviously, was not, and as such was the perfect spreader for the bacteria. And that's always kind of funny to me because ice cream is very much a privileged food. So unless she was, like, sneaking some to the servants, like, would servants be allowed ice cream? This is where the laundress thing has me going. It just, I'm just saying it's a weird one. Also, in addition, furthermore, because Mary had quite adamantly stated that she had never contracted typhoid in her life. The doctors theorised that Mary's mother contracted typhoid while she was pregnant with her, thus making her an asymptomatic carrier. Granted, we don't know that for sure, but I mean, it makes sense, I'm fairly certain. In March 1907, Mary is shipped off to North Brother Island, where she's quarantined. And she has to give stool and urine samples three times a week for two whole years. And over the course of those two years, 120 out of the 163 stool samples she gave tested positive. And she gets put on like 
a ton of medications. They put her on eurotropin, hexamethylenamine, laxatives, Ruhr's yeast. I mean, at this point, they're just throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping it sticks. Like, and Mary complains because she feels like she's being used as a guinea pig. They're just chucking a bunch of medicines at her and many of which are just making her feel really fucking ill. I mean, the, the eurotropin they put her on, it almost destroys her kidneys. And at one point, they want to surgically remove her gallbladder. But Mary, nobody thought to actually explain to her, you know, what a carrier was, how she could be asymptomatic and still, you know, spread the disease. Instead of, you know, trying to explain that in any reasonable way to the women, they just force her into quarantine and experiment on her, you know? There were interns and tuberculosis doctors and all of these people that would just come up and just poke her, prod her, ask her questions that she'd already been asked. And it was all, it was a lot for her to deal with, you know? Then she discovers that she has been nicknamed Typhoid Mary, which really pisses her off. So when George Sober shows up and is like, I'm going to write a book about this and I'll give you, I'll give you royalties so you can have money. But Mary tells him absolutely fucking not. Because, you know, she's mad. Because he, to her, in her eyes, he is the very reason she's in there. That she's locked away, right? And he ends up writing his book anyway and she gets nothing. So, yeah. Yeah. See, not every medical professional, though, was super into the fact that she was in a forced quarantine. They felt like it was like an overly strict punishment. That it was just, you know... A bit much, because Mary ends up having a breakdown, which, you know, we should not be surprised at, because it was very much a traumatic experience for her. So somehow, with the help of a friend, whom we do not know the name of, Mary manages to get stool samples, like, smuggled out and sent out to this independent New York laboratory, which come up as negative for typhoid. She then tries to sue the New York Health Department, but the Supreme Court just shuts it down. And there is a theory that the newspaper magnet William Randolph Hearst, that not only did he pay for, you know, the tests, that he got them out, but also that he covered the cost of her legal bills. By the time 1910 comes along, there's this new health commissioner who believes that isolation is not appropriate for disease carriers, that we really shouldn't be, you know, locking them up and hiding them away anymore. It's not cool. So he basically makes Mary Mallon sign an affidavit saying that she would no longer work as a cook, she would change her profession, and she would employ sanitary health and safety practices that would basically reduce the risk and avoid her spreading typhoid. Like that's that's the dealio, you know? And she agrees, signs whatever, and then she is released from quarantine and returns to the mainland. When Mary gets out, she manages to get a job as a laundress. She's following the rules. It doesn't pay as well as being a cook does because she's earning $20 a month instead of $50 a month. And at some point during this, she manages to hurt her arm in some way. Like there's a wound and it becomes infected. And because of that, she can't do this job for like six months. So she is unemployed for at least six months and thinks, oh, fuck this for a game of soldiers and starts cooking again. But obviously the name Mary Mallon, that's, um, that's a big red flag, especially to all of these prosperous New York families who are very much, you know, being super careful now because... She's famous, or infamous, I should say. Because no one wants the infamous, disease-ridden typhoid Mary cooking for them. So instead of working as a cook for families, she ends up working in sort of higher production kitchens. So she ends up working in restaurants, hotels, hospitals, spa centres. And basically, everywhere she works, there are typhoid outbreaks. And she keeps changing jobs, like she keeps hopping. But she's she's clever enough to keep job hopping. And she uses fake surnames like Brown or Breshoff. And at this point, 
George Soper is looking for her again because he knows, he knows it's her. So in 1915, she's working at the Sloan Hospital for Women, which is a maternity hospital in Manhattan. And she's there for three months. And while she's there, she contaminates at least 25 people. This includes, you know, patients, doctors, nurses, and like other staff and stuff. And two people die. And while she's there, she's working under, you know, the the nom de plume, the fake name, Mary Brown. And because there's a typhoid outbreak at his hospital, the head obstetrician calls up George Soper and is like, please help me, come figure this out. So George comes down, he investigates, he asks. So George comes down, he has a wee look around, he chats with staff and whatnot. And as it turns out, a woman matching the description of Mary Mallon was working in the hospital, but of course had gone fuck this for a game of soldiers and bollocked off. And so she was gone and George had just missed her. But it didn't take too long to find her because the police managed to, like, apprehend her while she was bringing food to a friend on Long Island. So, on the 27th of March, 1915, Mary gets sent back to quarantine on North Brother Island because she went against the affidavit and was working as a cook again, even though she promised she wouldn't. That was that was the deal. She went against it. However... Whether Mary is a victim or a villain depends on whether she started cooking again because she really couldn't do any other job because she had no other options. Like, that was her only way to survive because she was on the breadline. She was in poverty otherwise. Like, there's no other option. Or has she always been like, fuck this, fuck that, fuck you, fuck off, and was always going to go cook anyway? Like, we don't really know too much about Mary during her, like, second quarantine basically there for the rest of her life. That's 23 years. So for the next 23 years, she has this, she's given a cottage. So she's given this private cottage on North Brother Island. And from 1918, she's allowed to take day trips to the mainland. You know, like she gets to go away for the day. She gets a wee holiday. So she's not just stuck on the island. I'm not really sure it counts as quarantine if you're allowed to leave. In 1925, Dr. Alexandra Plavska, she has an internship on North Brother Island. And she has this lab in the chapel. Cool. So yeah, on the second floor of this chapel, there's a lab. There's a laboratory. And Dr. Plavska, she offers Mary a job as like a lab tech. So she ends up like washing bottles, taking notes, doing recordings. You know, just bits and pieces. Gives her something to do, I suppose. Instead of what other lack of activities there happens to be on quarantine island on the 25th of december 1932 christmas morning this dude is delivering something to mary and he finds her on the floor of her cottage um she's had a stroke she gets taken to the riverside hospital where she is confined to for the rest of her life you see the stroke caused half her body to be paralyzed and she never fully recovered from it So on the 11th of November, 1938, at 69 years old, Mary Mallon passes away from pneumonia. A grand total of nine people attend her funeral. Her body is cremated and her ashes are buried in St. Raymond Cemetery in the Bronx. Right, okay, so there are two conflicting reports about an autopsy. So there are some that say, you know, there was an autopsy and they found evidence of live typhoid bacteria and the and gallstones in the gallbladder. There's another claim saying that, you know, there was never an autopsy, this was all made up as a justification for keeping her locked up and quarantined for like 25 years, you know? And thus ends the story of Mary Mallon, Typhoid Mary. So what did we learn today? We learned that you should always wash your fucking hands. No excuses. Hygiene is very important. That's it. That's the lesson for the day. Wash your hands. And if you're sick, stay home. Don't infect people. So I was thinking, I was actually thinking about this a wee bit. And it's about the fact that she kept leaving these like positions. And Mary always stated that, you know, she never, she wasn't sick. She never had any symptoms. 
you know, so she didn't believe she was a carrier and stuff. So either she didn't believe that and she was, you know, jumping from pillar to post and leaving jobs and making people sick regardless and just leaving before she got caught or she was working places and saw the other servants get sick and went, fuck this, I'm not getting sick and basically left before she thought she was going to catch it. And if she'd done this a bunch of times, you know, this was her method of survival. But anyway, if you like, feel free to rate and review five stars. Um, If you want to support me in other ways, uh, there is a GoFundMe for a new laptop so I can get this audio better. There's also a Patreon, which I need to do some more stuff for. But again, that's a process. And of course, the tip jar, commonly known as PayPal, if you want to do anything there. All the links are in the description down below. And if you want to support me, I am on all of the social medias, or maybe not all of them, a few of them, a good few, um, on TikTok, Facebook and Instagram. It is Who Did What Now Pod. And on Twitter, it is Who Did What Now PD, because there were not enough characters. Uh, there's also a website which I'm working on. It's it's live, but it's there. And that is, and that is Who Did What Now Pod dot com. And of course, it is recommendation time. So for reading... I am going to recommend my friend Mel's book, um, Glass Houses by Melanie Murphy, out May 5th. Go get yourself a copy now. Absolutely. fucking lutely um, And she is an absolute delight, by the way. For watching, I'm going to tell you to go watch The Gilded Age. It is a feast for the eyes. I mean, it's good too. But like, aesthetically, it's very engaging. And for listening... I am going to recommend the Queen's podcast. Go check out Katie and Nathan. Uh, they are awesome. Uh, they also do history stuff um, and they swear probably the same, if not more than me, because there's two of them. There should be more swearers per person, right? Right? Anywho, with that, I am going to bid you adieu and I will chat to you next time. Adios. Au revoir. Au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.